from around the globe. It's the Cube with digital coverage of AWS reInvent 2020. Sponsored by Intel and AWS. Welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of AWS reInvent 2020 Live. I'm Lisa Martin, really exciting topic coming up for you next. Please welcome Blake Scholl, the founder and CEO of Boom Supersonic. Blake, it's great to have you on the program. Thank you for having me, Lisa. And your background gives it all away with what we're gonna talk about in the next few minutes or so, but supersonic flight has existed for quite a long time, what, 50 or so years. I think those of us in certain generations remember the Concorde, for example, but the technology to make it efficient and mainstream is only recently been uh, approved by or accepted by regulators. Tell us a little bit about Boom, your mission to make the world more accessible with supersonic commercial flight. Yeah. Well, uh, supersonic flight has actually been around since uh, 1949 when Chuck Yeager uh, broke the speed barrier, or sorry, the sound barrier. And uh, as, as many of you know, he actually passed yesterday at 97. So very, very sad to see one of the supersonic pioneers behind us. Uh, but, uh, but as I say goodbye to Yeager, a new era of supersonic flight is here. And if you look at the history of progress in transportation since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, uh, we used to make regular progress in speed we went, as we went from uh, the horse to the iron horse to the, to the boats to the early propeller airplanes and into the jet age. And what happened was every time we made transportation faster, instead of spending less time traveling, we actually spent more time traveling because there were more places to go, more people to meet. Uh, we haven't had a world war since the dawn of the jet age. Uh, places like Hawaii have become um, uh, major tourist destinations. Uh, but today, uh, today it's been 60 years since we've had a mainstream rent, uh, step forward in speed. And so what we're doing here at Boom is picking up where Concorde left off, building an aircraft that uh, flies faster by a factor of two than anything you can get a ticket on today, and yet is 75% more affordable than Concorde was. So we want to make Australia as accessible as Hawaii is today. We want to enable you to cross the Atlantic, do business, be home in time to tuck your kids into bed, or take a three-day business trip to Asia and let you do it in just 24 hours. I like the sound of all of that. Even getting on a plane right now in general, I think we all do. <laughs> so, so interesting that you, you want to make this more accessible. And I did see the news about Chuck Yeager last night. Um, designing, though, the first supersonic airliner overture, it's called, in decades, as you said, this dates back 60 years. Rolling it out, goal is to roll it out in 2025 and flying more than 500 transoceanic routes. Talk to me about how you're leveraging technology in AWS mm -hmm. to help facilitate that. Right. Well, so one of the really fascinating things is uh, the new generation of airplanes uh, are getting born in the cloud, and then they're going to go fly through actual clouds. And so there are there are a bunch of revolutions in technology that have happened since Concorde's time that are enabling what we're doing now. There are breakthroughs in materials. We've gone from aluminum to carbon fiber. There are breakthroughs in engines. We've gone from afterburning turbojets that are loud and inefficient to quiet, clean, efficient turbofans. But one of the most interesting breakthroughs has been in uh, being able to do design digitally and iteration digitally versus uh, versus physically. So when Concorde was designed as an example, they were only able to do about a dozen wind tunnel tests because they were so expensive and so time consuming. And on uh, on our XB1 aircraft, which is our prototype that rolled out in October, um, uh, we did hundreds of iterations of the design in virtual wind tunnels where we, we could spin up a, a a simulation, an HPC cluster on AWS, often more than 500 cores. And then we'd have our uh, airplanes flying through virtual wind tunnels, thousands of flight scenarios. You can figure out which are the losers, which are the winners, keep iterating on the winners. And you arrive at an aerodynamic design that is more efficient at high speed for going very safely, very quickly in a straight line, but also uh, very smooth, controllable for safe takeoff and landing. And the, part of the art of supersonic airplane design is to accomplish both of those things in one, one airplane. And uh, being able to design in the cloud and iterate in the cloud uh, allows a startup to do what previously only governments and militaries could do. I, I mentioned we rolled out our XB-1 prototype in October. That's the first time anyone has rolled out a supersonic civil aircraft since the Soviet Union did it in 1968. And wow. we're able to do it as a startup because of computing. That's incredible. Born in the cloud to fly in the cloud. So talk to me about a lot of, of opportunity that technology has really accelerated. We've seen a lot of acceleration this year in particular of digital transformation and businesses that if they haven't pivoted 
are probably in, in some challenging water. So talk to us about how you're going all in with AWS to facilitate all these things that you just mentioned, which is a dramatic change over 12 uh, wind tunnel tests for the Concorde and how many times did it fly people? Uh, I mean, for 27 years, but not that many flights. It never, it never changed the way mainstream, uh, it never changed the way you and I fly, right? Um, so, so how how are we going all in? So we've you know we've been using AWS for uh, you know, basically since the founding of the company. Uh, but what we what we're doing now is taking things that we were doing outside of the cloud and moving them to the cloud. Uh, as an example, uh, we have 525 terabytes of XB1 design and test data that we used to keep you know backed up offsite. Um, and, and what we're doing is migrating it to the cloud, and then your data is next to your compute. You can start to do these really interesting things. As an example, uh, you can run machine learning models to calibrate your simulations to your wind tunnel results, which accelerates convergence, allows you to run more iterations even faster, and ultimately come up with a more efficient airplane, which means it's going to be more affordable for all of us to go to go break the sound barrier. And that sounds like kind of one of the biggest differences that you just said is that it wasn't built for mainstream before. Now it's going to be accessibility, affordability as well. So how are you going to be leveraging the cloud, you know, design, manufacturing, but also other areas like the, the onboard experience, which I'm already really excited to be uh, participating in in the next few years? Yeah, so there's so many, so many examples. You know, we've talked about design a little bit already. Uh, it's going to manifest in the manufacturing process, uh, where the 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 the, the supply chain uh, will be totally digital. The uh, factory operations will be run out of the cloud. You know, so what that means concretely is, uh, you know, you know, literally there'll be like a million parts on this airplane, and for any given unit going through the production line, you'll instantly know where they all are. Um, you'll know which serial numbers went on which airplanes. Uh, you'll understand uh, if there was a problem with one of it, how you fixed it. And as you continue to iterate and refine the airplane, this, this is one of the things that's actually a big deal uh, with, with digital in the cloud, is you know exactly what design iteration went into exactly which airplane. And, uh, and that allows you to actually iterate faster. And any given airline with any given airplane will actually know exactly what, what airplane they have. But the next one that rolls off the line might be even a little bit better. And so it allows you to keep track of all of that. It allows you to iterate faster uh, it allows you to spot bottlenecks in your supply chain before they impact production. Um, and then it allows you to, uh, to to do preventive maintenance later. So there's going to be digital instrumentation all over the airplane. It's going to update the cloud on, you know, uh, are the engines running at expected temperature? Is something run a little bit hot? Is something vibrating more than it should vibrate? And so you catch these things way before there's any kind of real maintenance issue. You flag it in the cloud, and the next time the airplane lands, there's a tech waiting for the airplane with whatever the part is, and able to install it and you don't have any downtime and you're never anywhere close to a safety issue. You're able to do a lot more preventively versus what you can do today. Wow. So you have to say that, you, that you're going to be able to, to have 100% visibility into manufacturing design. Everything is kind of an understatement. But you launched XP1, your prototype, you said in October. So during the pandemic, as I mentioned, we've been talking for months now on the Virtual Cube about the acceleration of digital transformation. Andy Jassy talked about it in his keynote at AWS, reinventing, reinvent this year virtual. What were some of the, 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 the advantages that you got being able to stay on track, I imagine if you were on track to launch in October during a time that has been so chaotic everywhere else, including yeah. with air travel? Well, some of it's very analog uh, and some of it's very digital. So to, to start with the analog, uh, you know, we took COVID really seriously at Boom. Uh, we went into, when the, the pandemic first hit, we shut the company down for a couple of weeks so we can kind of get our feet underneath of us. And then we started testing uh, everyone who had to work on the airplane every 14 days. We were uh, religious about wearing masks. And as a result, we haven't had anyone catch COVID within the office. Um, and I, I'm super proud that we're able to stay productive and stay safe during the pandemic. Um, and, and you do that by kind of taking it seriously, doing common sense things. And then there's the digital effort. And, uh, and so, you know, part of the company runs digitally. What we're able to do is when there's kind of a higher alert level, we go a little bit more digital. When there's a lower alert level, uh, we have more people in the office because we, we still really do value that in-person collaboration. And, you know, it, which brings it back here to a, a bigger point. It's been predicted for a long time that the advent of digital communication is going to cause us not to need to travel. And, uh, it, and what we've seen, you know, since the dawn of, you know, the telephone <laughs> is that, that it's actually been the opposite. The more you can know somebody even a little bit uh, at distance, the hungrier you are to go see them in person, whether it's a business contact or someone you're in love with. 
um, you know, no matter what it is, there's still that appetite to be there in person. And so I think what we're seeing with the digitization of communication is ultimately going to just be very, um, it's very complementary with supersonic because you can get to know somebody a little bit over a long distance. You can have some kinds of exchanges and then you're, and then the friction for being able to see them in person is going to drop. And that is, uh, I think that's a wonderful combination. I, I think everybody on the planet welcomes that for sure, given what we've all experienced in the last year. You can have a lot of conversations by Zoom. Obviously, this is one of them. But there is, to your point, something about that in-person collaboration that really takes things, can anyway, to the next level. I am curious. So you launched XP1 in October. As I mentioned in a minute ago, and I think I read from one of your press releases Planning to launch in 2025 the overture with over 500 transoceanic routes. What can we expect from Boom in the next year or two? Are you on track for that 2025? Yeah, it's, uh, things are going things are going great. Uh, so to give a sense of what the next few years hold, so we rolled out the assembled XB1 aircraft this year. Uh, next year that's going to fly, and so that will be the first civil supersonic uh, flying aircraft ever built by an independent company. Uh, and along the way, we are building the foundation of Overture. So that design effort's happening now. As XB1 is breaking the sound barrier, we'll be finalizing the Overture design. In 22, we'll break ground on the factory. In 23, we'll start building the first airplane. In 25, we'll roll it out. In 26, we'll start flight tests. And, uh, and then we'll go through the flight tests methodically, uh, systematically, as carefully as we can, uh, and then be ready to carry passengers as soon as we are convinced it's safe, which will be right around the end of the decade, most likely. Okay, exciting. And so it sounds like you talked about the safety protocols that you guys put in place in the office, which is great. It's great to hear that. But also that this this time hasn't derailed because you have the massive capabilities of AWS to be able to do all of the work that's necessary, way more than was done with, before with the Concord, and that you can do that remotely with cloud as a big facilitator of that communication. Yeah, you're able to do I mean, the, the cloud enables a lot of computational efficiencies. And I think about the um, many times projects are not measured in hey, how many months or years exactly does it take you to get done. But it's actually much easier to think about in terms of number of iterations. And so every time we do an airplane iteration, we look at the aerodynamics high speed. We look at the low speed. We look at the engine. Uh, we look at the, the weights. Uh, we look at stability and control. We look at pilots, line of sight, et cetera, et cetera. And every time you do an iteration, you're kind of looking around all of those and saying, what can I make better? But each one of those uh, lines up a little bit differently with the rest. You know, for example, uh, uh, to get the, the best airplane aerodynamically doesn't have a good view for the pilot. And that's why Concorde had that droop nose, famously. Yeah. It was like, get the nose out of the way so we can see the runway. And so we're able to do digital systems for virtual vision to let the pilot kind of look through the nose of the runway. But even then, there are trade-offs, like how, you know, how good of a natural window do you need? And so your ability to make progress in all of this is proportional to how quickly you can make it around that, that iteration loop, that design cycle loop. And that's, that's part of where the cloud helps us. And we've, we've got some, uh, uh, some stuff we've built in-house that runs on the cloud that lets you basically press a button with a whole set of airplane parameters and bam, it gives you a, uh, it gives you an instant report of like, oh, was it better, was this a good change or a bad change? Uh, based on running some pretty high fidelity simulations with a very high degree of automation. And you can actually do many of those in parallel. And so it's about, you know, at this stage of the program, it's about accelerating, accelerating your design iterations, uh, giving everyone on the team visibility into those. And then uh, I think you get together in person as it makes sense to. Now we're actually hitting a major design milestone with Overture this week. And we're COVID testing everybody and get them all in the same room because sometimes that in-person collaboration uh, is really significant, even though you can still do so much digitally. I totally agree. There's there's certain things that you just can't replicate. Last question, since my brother is a pilot for Southwest and retired Lieutenant Colonel from the Air Force, any special training that pilots will have to have? Are there certain pilots that are, are going to be maybe lower hanging fruit if they have military experience versus commercial flight? Just curious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so our XP-1 aircraft is uh, being flown by test pilots. Uh, there's one ex-Navy, one ex-Air Force on our crew. But uh, Overture uh, will be accessible to any commercial pilot. So uh, think about it as if you're, if you're used to flying Boeings, it'd be like switching to Airbus uh, or vice versa. So the uh, Concorde was a complicated aircraft to fly because they didn't have computers. And all the complexity of, the super, of, of supersonic flight was right there in the pilot's hands. And an overture, all that gets abstracted by software and uh, you know, the, the, the ways the flight controls change over speed regimes. You don't have to worry about it. But the, the, 
the airplane will just handle beautifully no matter what you're doing. And so, uh, and so there are many, many places to innovate, but actually pilot experience is not one of them because the more conventional you can make it for people like your brother, the easier it's going to be for them to learn the aircraft and therefore the safer it's going to be to fly. I'll let him know. Like, this has been fantastic. Really exciting to see what Boom Supersonic is doing and the opportunities to make supersonic travel accessible. And I think at a time when everybody wants the world to open up. So by 2026, I'm going to be looking for my ticket. Awesome. Can't wait to have you on board. Uh, likewise. For Blake Scholl, I'm Lisa Martin. You're watching theCUBE's live coverage of AWS reInvent 2020.